ho ho and welcome back to another episode of region free i say ho 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 don't don't act too surprised uh because today we're talking about a christmas movie in the vaguest sense of terms this movie yeah. yeah there's there's some christmas in this movie um you know a little bit that was a couple of holidays ago but it doesn't matter now because mm. it's tis the season to talk about a great film as we you know our 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 batting average so far on this podcast just the handful of episodes that we're in all great films. Let's keep it rolling. Uh-huh. Let's keep it cooking. Uh-huh. Um, we actually control that because we don't keep up with new releases. We can actually just pick movies <laughs> we, just we like, know yeah. are good. Um, today we're talking about 2014's The World of Conoco. I made the grave error of thinking this film was just called World of Conoco. But there is a the. Um, mm. they, they did not follow Justin Timberlake and the Social Network's advice. They kept the the. Didn't drop it. Though it might have been sure. cleaner, the World of Conoco uh, from 2014. Actually, I I don't think I knew that. I thought it was World of Conoco. I also thought I I thought the same thing. You led me astray, perhaps. Yeah, you know, it'll only happen once. <laughs> ne- never once in my life has Blake Hester led me astray. <laughs> um, directed by Tetsuya Nakashima, um, who you know is notorious for a couple of films like kamikaze girls and confessions mr blake Mm -hmm. Hester, have you seen either of those or were you coming Mm -hmm. into this one cold yeah this was no my first exposure to him as well he's pretty celebrated in japan it seems like has a couple awards Mm -hmm. and nominations to his name uh confessions is definitely one i plan on seeking out after this because it sounds like it's got a similar setup and vibe going on but uh this movie was quite quite an interesting Let's trip. Let's get into it. People don't talk about World of Conoco, and it's one of the most buck-wild movies you can see of the last 15 years. Yeah. It's so out of control. Almost a decade old, I, I'm realizing now, but mm-hmm. feels very like this could have came out last month and kind of has that it looks so good. cutting edge to it. Um, mm. What I will say, you know, from... The jump from frame one, second one, um, I literally could not take my eyes off the screen. And I mean that in the truest sense, because the editing rhythm of this film is in such a way that if you take your eyes off the screen for two seconds, you're probably going to miss some crucial information, especially at the beginning, because it is playing okay. loose and fast with the information. Let me let me let me ask you, I, I'd like to set the scene. So uh, I had seen this movie before. My background with it was uh, I had seen the thumbnail of World of Conoco on numerous streaming services saying, hey, we think you'd like this. And I was like, that's the most boring thumbnail I've ever seen. And I remember like getting annoyed with it. I would see it so often. I was like, this movie looks like dog shit. And then one day I was like, let me watch the trailer for this dog shit movie. I keep getting suggested. And I've literally never hit rent quicker on Amazon. I was wow. like, I'm watching this right now. So watched it blind. Had no clue other than the trailer, which probably... I assume was not in English. I don't even know if it had the subtitles. Sometimes the trailers just don't. Went into it completely blindsided by it. I've told you for the past few years, you have to watch this movie. Did you go into it with like I did with no foreknowledge? Well, yeah, I, I had a similar experience for years and years and years. Blake Hester's been like, you got to check out this movie. And I'm like in the same sort of way. Oh, my fucking God. Blake's from <laughs> recommending me another movie. Gee, I might as well just bite the bullet and watch this fucking thing. Yeah, right. Uh, okay. No, I'm assuming you're talking about the image uh, of conoco with the sort of mm-hmm. blood splatter in the back and, and they it's boring yeah it's very boring it's looking. you know it's evocative it kind of works i don't know what the poster would be for this movie maybe something from the beginning credits because it does have a sort of mm. very stylized noir like <laughs> doing like real pulpy stuff with splash effects and like text on screen for the first 15 ish minutes no you know what that persists for a while actually mm-hmm. now that i think about it but i really like the first 15 minutes of this movie i guess is what i was getting at there um there's a cool poster to an alternate poster i was looking at that's sort of that image and then kind of split right down the middle with uh yeah. the main character from the end which i think is a really cool image as well well i think point being is this movie is very unassuming until you turn it on and it's perhaps appropriately like a baseball bat to the damn face. You begin making uh, assumptions. Yeah, uh, the f- you brought it up. I think the first 15 minutes of this movie are incredible. Yeah. Like the pacing, the editing, the raw acting, the way it is oscillating between all these different characters going through all these different either uh, 
great emotions or physical activities or sheer like horrific trauma all at once. It is something Tarantino wishes he could do on his best days. <laughs> Look, I mean, it's definitely uh, they have seen Reservoir Dogs when they're making the sure. start of this movie for sure. Uh, lots of it's like so it's it's that con- there's a convenience store robbery. You're cutting mm-hmm. between just like really tight flashes of like a character's face being like, "I hate you. I'm gonna kill you." I love you. All these sorts of things. There's a man getting his brains blown out in the biblical sense, if you know what I mean. In that in that most carnal way. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, There is a car crash. There is a dance scene. A suicide. A triple murder. All the while, everything's just blaring in your face. You aren't sure what's happening. There's bags being held over a woman's face and she's suffocating. Yeah. Like... The movie is like, welcome to hell, <laughs> buckle up, fuck face. And I mean, to... never once telling you anything about any of these characters. Though to its credit, it will slowly unravel over two hours that you can dissect that entire 15 minute hyper montage and be like, oh, that's the entire plot of the movie right there. Yeah, we were talking about this right before we started recording. Uh, but I said I watched this movie 1.25 times because I definitely, mm-hmm. as soon as it ended, like went back and rewatched the beginning because it is something that's so striking a little alarming like it's definitely designed to throw you off and it does but yeah Mm -hmm. to its credit as i was gonna say it's flashing you with all this like violent sensationalist imagery and you know you're gonna get back to it all eventually it's sort of like you sit down uh, with your big bucket of popcorn you you watch trailers for a bunch of other bullshit movies and then this movie's like (laughs) okay here's what you came to see we're gonna show you an extended trailer for everything you're about Mm -hmm. to watch for the next two-ish hours you know well you know what it's very evocative of is like um, Dead or Alive by Takashi Miike, mm-hmm. which like begins with this explosive sequence of a man like snorting a basketball court lines worth of cocaine, and then throwing the woman off the hotel or off the uh, theater roof, and the guy get, getting fucked and also stabbed at the same time. Like it very much feels like that kind of opening. And honestly, I wouldn't be shocked if it was just like a direct homage to Dead or Alive one, not the <laughs> video game or the. Paul W.S. Anderson <laughs> film adaptation, the Takashi Miike. Yeah, uh, movie. There's a common interest in in getting the audience hooked and really kind of keeping their butts mm-hmm. in their seats up top. Like they're sort of um, trying to keep them there until that that window passes where they can walk back out into the lobby and ask for a refund. They're like, we're going to give you, <laughs> we're going to give you all the good stuff up top. They, I don't think they do I that think, anymore. I think um, I th- they don't do what the like. If you if you aren't vibing with a movie, fifteen minutes in, you can walk out and be like, "Hey, this one's not for me." Is that true? Like a Steam refund if you only play <laughs> an hour of the game? Yeah, is that a real thing. That used to be in, in movie theaters. I feel like I don't know. Maybe this is just like a they should a have. tall tale, an urban myth. They should have. I wouldn't have lost fucking twelve dollars to Dune. Oh come on! You can't say that on this <laughs> it's podcast. It's a bad movie. It's a bad movie. I can't say it. this is the perfect podcast to say. Oh, Dune is a bad movie. Yeah. Okay. A- appropriately, we have not begun to broach what World of Conoco is about, which I think is good because we have front loaded the conversation by ju- with just sex and violence with no context. But kind of similarly to how the movie does it, exactly. That's what I'm <laughs> saying. But like, um, let's unpack it. Yeah, I'm going to read you the plot summary here, and you sort of tell me, you know what you might imagine this movie to be like. Uh, So here we go. When Kaneko, a model daughter and brilliant student, disappears, her mother asks her ex-husband, a violent former policeman, to find her. As his investigation progresses, his idealized image of Kaneko cracks. There's a colon there, a very dramatic colon. The girl hides a dark life that her father cannot even imagine. I think that's pretty incorrect to the movie. We, one, don't know about Kaneko's studies at all. Also, (laughs) the father, I believe has a pretty clear idea not as in he has an idea that Conico is not good before the events of this film yeah. as we get flashbacks to an interaction between them he obviously does not know the extent to which his teenage daughter is an evil human being but uh yeah that seems like an incorrect synopsis now this was brought to america by alamo draft house yeah alamo releasing so, where i got the blu-ray uh, go to your local alamo and demand that they rewrite that on letterbox say come on what are you doing here yeah and also demand they stop running food out in the middle of movies it drives me crazy <laughs> that's kind Why of their whole that? thing that's, that's unbearable i'll never go back to an alamo except the one aj is going to take me to in north carolina yeah i mean we're gonna go see wild things whenever you come here 
<laughs> Yo. I uh, can't, can't watch that in a room with another person. <laughs> we'll see about that. Look, from the jump in this movie, you know, you're getting, I don't want to say generic, but like straightforward uh, noir plotting. It's very much mm. like, I think to its to it, to its strength, it introduces a lot of like familiar tropey elements, sort of things that are like iconic in in mm-hmm. cinema storytelling, where it's like, oh, uh, kind of split up couple, deadbeat detective dad, uh, distanced from his daughter, estranged from his ex wife. He's a drinker. He's prone to violence. Like he pushed his family Smoker, away because he's so toker. exactly dedicated to his yeah. work. Um, and I think you know this movie starts to sell you on a premise you feel like maybe you've seen before, and so it lets your guard down. You start sort of watching on autopilot, where you're like, "Look, if this is just a sort of serviceable mystery, there is enough mm-hmm. style on top of the you know basic structure here that I'm having a you know." I'm not having a bad time watching World of Conoco. Yeah. Uh, that innocent assumption lasts for maybe like, you know, half an hour before it starts to peel back the layers. And, you know, this is sort of how the film is structured. It's continually just like pulling down sheets and being like, hey, uh, something fucked up behind this one. Oh, you thought that was bad? Uh, look over here. You kind of forgot about this. I'm going to like. Yeah. It re- I mean, it also has Koji Yakusho who like. You'll know from Cure or uh, Thirteen Assassins or Memoirs of a Geisha, Tempopo, Babel, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Also um, a, uh, a played... skilled voice actor too. Yeah, yeah, well, he's kind of like reprising some older roles as like a cop, but it's clear he is not the. Uh, even in Cure, he wasn't a great cop. <laughs> you know, the movie's kind of unpacking him on the edge, but like we start to see cracks in the facade of the like typical stoic Japanese film cop protagonist who. You know, maybe is a little aggressive, but all in search of the greater good. Like, this is a dude who is completely... This is a cop that has uh, done what I think a lot of cops do. Uh, let that aggression go to their head and destroy their entire lives and family. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, not only is he not a good cop, he's a, a pretty bad person. <laughs> this is... I think the tagline for this movie should be, What if the worst man on the planet tried to go find the worst woman on the planet? Yeah, <laughs> like, Yochem Trier kind of stole it out from under this one, but this movie could have been called yeah. The Worst Person in the World because yes, sir. There's, there a few, there's a few There's a few of them in here. So, like, we're... I, I, I love the title sequence of this movie where it feels like a noir and western all at once, and yeah. there's kind of, like, just just verbs flashing on the screen, like, kill fuck blast <laughs> oh, i think well, at one point it's like hit 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 when they're well, doing a so fight at, at this point all we know is yakusho's character he plays a character called akikazu fuji food fujishima um who is this disgraced cop he's now kind of just like living a security guard he gets a call from his ex-wife who says kaneko is missing you know this comes at the end of the very wild uh, 15 minutes at the beginning where things are just kind of flashing at us. We're starting to see the story here. And then he goes to his ex-wife's house where we learn <laughs> quite how fraught their relationship is. AJ, I didn't know this when I first saw this, but his wife is played by Asuka Kurosawa, who is the lead in A Snake of June. Excellent actress. Yeah, I, I thought that was kind of cool. I had, I had only seen her in Snake of June and did not immediately recognize her because it's like 20 years between the uh, two. But it was awesome to see her again. There were a couple of actors who were definitely familiar to me in this as soon as they walked on mm-hmm. screen. Her, um, the teacher, she was also in Silence, Martin Scorsese's Silence, by the way. I haven't seen that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I still haven't uh, seen that. The teacher, I want to get it right. She's in something else. Miki Nakatani? Yeah, she was in... She's in Ring. Yes, that's what it was. She's in the original yeah. ring, which is, is you know a great performance and a great movie as well. So people people kept walking on screen, and I was like, oh, I know you from somewhere. Um, well, also June Kunimura, who's in every movie ever made, like an audition, <laughs> The yeah. Wailing, uh, Shin Godzilla, the Kill Bill movies. Like he, if you watch a movie with Japanese people in it, he there's like a ninety percent chance he's going to show up somewhere in the film. Yeah, that, that tends 165 to happen. Hundred sixty five credits to that man's name. Look! Oh, he's also in Hard Boiled. Good work if you can get it. Yeah, he's literally in everything. Jesus <laughs> Christ! Midway, Outrage, every movie ever made. 
Okay. Every single one. He, he, and if he, you can't see him, he's just behind the camera in some of them. Yeah, he's an extra. In yeah, the he's like, that's my somewhere. hand. Um, mm-hmm. Look, yeah, we, we kind of get that initial mystery of your seemingly kind of angelic, precocious daughter has gone missing. And even now still we're in, you know, what I would call familiar territory where we're like, okay, mm-hmm. this movie is sort of setting me up for a CD journey uh, into the Japanese underworld so this guy can figure out, you know, what's wrong with himself come to peace with some of that, make some amends, and then eventually reunite I, with his I, daughter. I will push back <laughs> on that immediately. I don't think he's trying to make amends. Well, no, but this I is... I don't think we know the extent to why he wants to reunite with his daughter, but I don't think it's for any noble purpose from the jump. This movie holds uh, its cards close to its chest very early on, and again, sure. kind of starts to lay them out one by one. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's the impression i get just coming into this okay, cold and it's playing yeah. by those uh genre conventions right mm-hmm. <laughs> it immediately starts to knock those down pretty quickly but i think it's worth sure. worth pointing out that like it is very consciously playing into your expectations up top um and then like i i think you know one of the coolest bits of this movie is how it will keep returning to the same sequence and then showing you a little bit more or like the same kind yeah. of characters i'm thinking of what it does with uh like the boys from school in particular you sort of Mm -hmm. cut back to the same moment a handful of times and you learn a little bit more each time uh which you know this isn't the first movie to do that but i just think coupled with the style um and the really sort of like nihilistic writing at the core of this it definitely makes for a unique experience we um early on when when our main character goes to his ex-wife's house they find drugs in kaneko's purse and pictures of her with a boy whose name is uh, Ogata. Mm-hmm. And we we are given our first flashback, which I think is, aside from the opening credits, which, like, I don't know, movies usually have flashy openings. That's how they keep you in your seat. But, like, I think the first real moment you learn that, like, oh, this movie is going to be visually very striking is the first flashback. Where just all of a sudden, it's an anime. It's an anime, like yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's so cool. We completely jump back three years in time to a different protagonist. Yeah. Interestingly, like, the this movie oscillates between the present day and three years in the past often. And Kaneko, despite being the namesake, at least in the American release, I don't think, uh, in the Japanese release. It was released... Never the pro- She's never the protagonist of either timeline, which I thought was cool. There's always a distance between Kaneko, which narratively makes sense the further you get yeah. in the movie. She's obviously uh, much more present in the past storyline. Um, sure. But you do, like, you know, glimpse her through these flashbacks. And I think that's part of the strength of the storytelling is you are always uh, getting to know Kaneko through one of these POV characters, whether it's her father mm-hmm. I think there are some scenes that kind of hinge on her relationship with her mother and the teacher. And then, yeah, this kid who is, I think he's called I, but like is credited as the narrator. Um, He does narrate the sort of past sequences, but you're introduced to him with, yeah, this very stylish across the universe looking sequence where he's swimming and just talking about how like, that's the only time he feels free. He's bullied at school. Again, all this sort of familiar stuff you get. Um, But yeah, you learn about her, sort of relationships at school which again at the jump still kind of early in the film seem very sunny seem very positive seem very sort of like normal high school drama where it's like oh here's the boy she has the crush on her cute little friends there's a nice little sequence of them like reading a a romance manga in the staircase at school and they're all laughing and you're like okay right these are japanese school kids i'm sort of familiar with with how this is all supposed to work right Right. Uh, and the movie's still setting you up uh at this point it never abandons. The whole film always has this very, like, shaky cam, gonzo style, like, uh, cinematography. But this is the first time it gets lighter in terms of just, like, brighter and softer feeling. Oh, yeah. Despite all the shakiness, which I don't know that I always love in the flashbacks that it just maintains that, like, visual style. But the music also gets lighter. And it lulls you into this false sense of security where you're like, oh, okay, when I flash back in time, things will calm down. <laughs> and... It's it all like we do watch a kid get the absolute shit kicked out of him in the beginning, but like you start to think like okay, when I flash back, things will be okay, and uh, very quickly they aren't. But this first moment back, you're like, oh, this is kind of nice. This is a different different feel to this movie. 
not a ton of information divulged at this point in the past storyline as well. You're still sort of setting up your major players because when we flash back to the present timeline, basically what we get is a sequence of uh, Fuji child Fu- abuse. <laughs> well, right. I, I was about to say Fujishima just basically revealing himself to be uh, one of the biggest pieces of shit <laughs> imaginable. You sort of get he's like, oh, uh, my bitch ex-wife cheated on me. Uh, my daughter hates me. And then it's like, well, you know. You did, like, kind of beat the shit out of both of them, uh, rammed into the car that your wife was cheating on you in, and just, like, kept driving. He uses that trick this a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> this movie's obsessed with cars getting T-boned and you seeing it from inside the car. Which, here's the thing, it always looks great. You remember that commercial a couple of years ago with the family and they get T-boned? It's always a very visually striking. I don't thing know if I remember that. Film. I don't know if I remember. I think it was that like commercial. an Allstate commercial. I think it was like an Allstate commercial. Um, I remember the, it was one very of those well trouble trouble guys. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy could, you know, um, talking about the the personification of chaos. Uh, that could that could be a good substitute analog for our for our protagonist here. Yeah, because he's uh, not doing great when we when we meet up with him in this you movie. Know, I have certainly not seen every movie that Koji Yakusho is in, but of the ones that I have seen, he always plays like a very similar character who is like very stoic. Um, it's like kind of man's man, quiet unless he needs to be. And Cure, that's kind of peeled away in the back third of the movie. But like, I will say of the handful of films I've seen him in, uh, this is the... Definitely the wildest character I've seen him play in terms of just, like, from the jump, this man is overacting. And I mean that as, like, a very high compliment. I think it's a great performance. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's fantastic. But, like, granted, I can't speak to his whole career. But, like, if you're familiar with him just from, like, the ten pole movies he's been in that have come to the West, like, this is a much, much different performance than you're probably used to from him. Yeah, and this movie kind of plays a trick, again, where it, like... It, it's sort of one of those things where it's like he's the protagonist just by necessity, but the movie mm-hmm. in no way expects you at the end of the day to think uh, that he's a good guy or that he's doing anything kind of in the in the right. Uh, his spiral is pretty quick and fast into just like the negative zone. Yeah, here's a question. Are any characters innocent in this film? Because at first I was like the wife and like, I mean... I don't know. Like her greatest sin is she cheated on her shitty husband. Yeah, she's like, but like Eve. She's the one who, at the end of the day, you're like, I'm, I'm kind of glad she got out of this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the movie does really cast her aside in kind of a narratively sloppy yeah. way, but uh, maybe the teacher at the end no. and the student, though they both kind of like yeah. torture people. <laughs> yeah, I guess the wife. She just had an affair. That's her greatest. Crime. The um, like, I don't know. The narrator student. I mean, like, yeah, he's sort of, I think, the one who's most realistically kind of pushed to the brink and becomes a bad guy. Like, he goes through some pretty rough stuff and then is acting kind yeah. of solely out of revenge. And that's not good, but compared but the to... the teacher, the teacher is the same way, right? Yeah, the teacher does, you know, end up... I don't want to jump right there immediately she is sort of the uh ultimate bad guy at the end of this movie given just what the setup is <laughs> no she's the good guy the teacher she saves the day doesn't she stab and kill kanako to death and then bury her and forget where she is i'm so- do you think kanako should still be in the streets <laughs> after everything you've learned no about her? but what i'm saying vigilante is- justice this- if you ask me this movie's like look just just in terms of the plotting of the film it's like hey Where's Kaneko? It, it 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 walks you all the way up to the end, being like, "Hey, we've we're gonna spend a lot of time unpacking this mm-hmm. mystery, at least in the present timeline of like, who kind of knows where Kaneko is, what happened here." You meet a lot of CD characters, and we can dig into that. But at the end of the day, the sort of shoe that drops is like, Kaneko has been dead for a while because she pissed off yeah. a lot of people. Um, yeah, and that's sort of the um, ultimate justice air and, quotes and learned... of the film. And we learn how many people are searching for Conoco. So we alluded to this murder at the beginning in a convenience store. So that was actually seen by um, Yakusho's character, whose name... I'm sorry, you're going to have to cut around me looking up the name of the fucking character in the goddamn movie. 
uh, that's actually seen by Fujishima, so he has to go uh, give, you know, a, a testimony to the police who you can't really tell if they're just fucking with him or they think maybe he committed the murder, but that gets him kind of on this watch list of this cop, um, Detective Asai, who I love. He's Another just bad smiling. guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's just smiling and laughing and eating a lollipop the whole time. He's very flamboyant. He's uh, very adorable. He's Joker-fied. <laughs> That's right. Also in uh, Tokyo Drift, funny enough. Um, so the, now you, he has the cops on his side, and the cops are letting him in the search for Kaneko. It, unbeknownst to you, but, like, this cop kind of go on his own – this ex-cop, I should say, go on his own investigation. And just occasionally they check in, and they're like, you're kind of a dumbass, but have fun out there. So you never really know why the cops are entertaining him. But that does start to point to there is not just one mad father and mother searching for this woman. And we start to learn that, like, oh, maybe Kaneko was involved with drugs, so her father's – talking to some friends that might be uh, also involved in drugs. Do you do you know my daughter? You went to the same school. You look like you do drugs. It's yeah. not the most tasteful handling of drugs. It's a very funny scene world. where he's like, kind of, he tries to interrogate them in public and then they just make a very loud stink and they're like, you're weird and you're bothering us. They like yell that at him and just walk away. And I'm like, look, that's a good kind of yeah. tactic to diffuse a situation like that. It's it's very funny the beginning of this movie in retrospect by everything you learn at the end, but like obviously the man he's he's like he thinks his daughter is doing bad things, but in the innocent way, like ah she I guess she's doing drugs. Exactly, that yeah. Sucks. It's like drugs he like finds evidence of drug use and he's like mm -hmm. Well that's not good if she's missing and then he starts to be like, Hang on a second, like are her friends in a gang? And then it is like Yeah is there prostitution sex trafficking involved and then it's like what's going on here <laughs> yeah he's like he's interviewing kaneko's friends and you know they're saying oh kaneko was great her her friend killed himself that seemed to really bum her out um and she made friends with the, this guy that was kind of sketchy but kaneko was great kaneko was great and he's like huh this guy who was kind of sketchy and he goes and interviews the teacher and she's kind of being very coy, like, I don't really know what's going on. And so finally, uh, he just takes it into his own hands. I'm going to go find this guy uh, who appears, he sees, you know, a younger picture of him. And it looks like a similar picture that the cop had handed to him as a murder suspect in the convenience store murder. And he's like, you know what? This is obviously years apart here, but these might be the same people. I'm going to go track down this Yakuza kid, see uh, what's what might be happening here? And I think that's the point where all hell breaks loose when we get involved with the Yakuza. Yeah. Um, is this all before or after he sexually assaults his ex-wife? Because that was an early moment where I was like, this guy is oh. not on the up and up. Because it, it, it's really hard to say what comes before or after what terrible thing he does to yeah. this film. It, it's sort of like it toes the line up front of being like, clearly something's going on here. This guy is probably not in the right headspace or moral authority to be the one figuring it out. And it's like, but here's a sort of it 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 flips up a bunch of guess who character boards, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, here's this this teacher, uh, this ex-boyfriend character, a bunch of these friends, and it's like everyone's maybe got something going on that they're not talking about. And rather than yeah. like weaving those um into a sort of intricate web of plotting this movie kind of just flips them all down and it's like, look, everyone's kind of uh, fucked up yeah. and a, a yeah. kind of a bad guy. Yeah. Uh, our main character though, does seem to be the most mentally ill. We do learn he has schizophrenia and he, maybe borderline personality yeah. disorder. He's heavily medicated throughout the entire film. Uh -huh. Not to excuse any of his actions because they're all reprehensible, but like that does explain, uh, I think, a lot of his outbursts as opposed to some of the other characters. Yeah, this is definitely one of those movies where the character that you are following is sort of uh, the one who is, you know, the deepest in it. Like, really... Mm -hmm. at at the, at their worst state and sort of with the most on the line and the most to lose. And so it adds to this kind of like paranoid freneticism that influences the entire style of the film, uh, both from like the cinematography to the editing, um, this mm -hmm. like very uh, 
I don't even know how to describe it, free-flowing back and forth between timelines and POV characters. It just all sorts of gives it this sense that, like, whatever you're seeing, you know that it's not the entire truth. This film, I've never made a movie. I don't know if you know that about me, AJ. Um, really? It, I, I don't really know how movies are made. Now, with that said, this movie feels like it would be a nightmare to write, direct, and edit. Like, there's so many ways where it's often just throwing you into the thick of moments. Mm -hmm. Where, like, I do think this movie makes sense. It's very convoluted. Definitely. But, like, by the end, you will know just about everything that has ever happened to every character. Like, all your questions will mostly be answered. But, like, in terms of just how it is all delivered, I could not imagine piecing this thing together yeah it is based on a novel we should mm -hmm. mention that um the novel i believe uh endless thirst by akio fukamachi who was you know involved somewhat in the production of this film it was like the the book was about a decade old when they started making this movie um and so he was kind of involved and like oversaw the story production, I obviously don't know how closely it follows one to one, but I think that kind of gave them a foundation in a sense to build the story out and then start adding in those stylistic flourishes. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, if I have like an overarching problem with the movie, it's maybe that it sort of returns to some similar themes or sort of like moments of outlandish violence a couple times too many like at, at, at some point it sort of just starts obfuscating for this for the sake of like cross-cutting between a lot of different things and just driving home this sense that like yeah this is a really bad situation i think like you know towards the end it maybe starts to like I've I've kind of gotten the point. Maybe I've figured it out, and I'm waiting to, to mm. for them to land the plane. Uh, so I, you know, it might be too long for its own good. But it's not like there's anything on screen that's ever, well, you know, it's not like I like any of it. But it's not like it's not entertaining or engaging. My biggest problem with the movie is I hate Alice in Wonderland and Alice down the rabbit hole as a quick metaphor. I think it's cheap and lazy, and this movie uses it, and I think it's dumb. Yeah, is that true? Like, how, many how many movies are we going to watch where it's like, hey, just in case you're not understanding what we're getting at here, you ever heard of Alice? All right, now we're all on the same page. That's I hate that. The Matrix hater. Uh, I think The Matrix is cool. I'm into <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, let's talk about what's happening. Like, Eventually, the movie plays its hand. I'd say about halfway through, you you get enough from the story to be like, ah, uh, kind of go bad. Yeah. Really bad. Well, this is not good. What's happening? Again, it sort of reveals it a couple of times where it's like, mm -hmm. she wasn't, you know, just habitually using drugs. She was sort of selling or circulating or getting people hooked on them. And then it's like, oh, okay. She was also kind of involved with this yakuza adjacent gang who were like blackmailing people and kidnapping and it's like well she shouldn't be associating with them and then it's kind of like she's not only associating with them she's sort of in charge of a couple of them or like yeah. you know working very directly with them um and and good and how we learn what they're doing is one some of the most visually striking moments in the film um but it returns to our flashbacks three years ago following I, the narrator, who, you know, Kaneko has kind of started up this this little puppy dog romance and invites him to a party. And he's obviously maybe a little out of his element, but he goes. Yeah. And then we're jumping back and forth in time between what Yakusho's character is doing and this party, which is this, every time we go to the party, it's awesome. It is just this blare of J-pop and yeah. frenetic, frenetic Very, like, editing and like photographs that are, because there's a person taking pictures the whole time and the pictures will flash on screen. Uh -huh. It's crazy. Look it up on YouTube if you haven't seen this movie. They put the, the little, scenes. they put the little stickers like on the Polaroids in real time where they're yeah. like cute little sparkles, uh, a cat. It's, it's so sick. But the kid goes to the party. He's getting fucked up as he does. Kaneko's kind of ignoring him, but you know he's still just he's still just trying to fit in, and uh, he gets a little too drunk, 
and we learn the actual operations going on here, which, folks, there's no uh, easy way to say this one out loud on the internet airwaves for all the FBI to hear. So, AJ, why don't you say it? Yeah, I mean, uh, two two weeks in a row uh, where we're talking about sodomy on this podcast, but they kidnap him, they put him in kind of a, a garbage bag, they dress him up in a, like... I didn't get a, a great look at it. It's some sort of made outfit, right? Uh, and then they, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they violate him. And Well, an older man does. Yeah. Then they and throw him we, in a river. Uh, and we, uh, we learn that Conoco and her merry band of idiots are helping orchestrate a, uh, I, I don't know, human trafficking ring for yeah. old men, rich, powerful old men. To have their way with children, and then we all have to live with that knowledge as their last, the back half of this entire movie it, has to play. It's about at this point too. It flashes back and sort of at because these the scenes where she's meeting I and they're getting to know each mm. other. Oh, let's 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 pause for a sec here and just say terrible idea to name a character in a movie I when you expect people to talk about it. Uh, it's just like I. <laughs> And then I get I gets kidnapped. And it's just like this is a nightmare. Um, and then I got saw it. Yeah, the the, narr- <laughs> the narrator, uh, our POV character in the flashback sequence is the swimmer. Maybe we can call him. They're kind of having this meet cute, um, and he's like talking to her her friends as we as we set up. Where it's like, oh, she had this boy she had a crush on in the past, uh, and he tragically like killed himself. There's a scene where like you see everyone at the funeral, and they're all seemingly distraught and Conoco actually like goes up to his body in the coffin and like smooches him on the lips in front of everyone and you're like wow okay she's really like this hit her pretty hard I feel bad for this girl it's about the same time this is revealed where it's like no she like did the whole blackmail thing to him already and was sort of Mm. the one who pressured Mm -hmm. him into uh no committing suicide no no we learn from the Yakuza character that they had done that to him, and the whole reason Kaneko got involved with this was for was revenge. To get revenge. Yeah, because she ended up leaking everything. Yes, um, about what was happening, which does not excuse. I guess she had to just play the part of like she was helping them, but like her whole reason was because Ogata, her old boyfriend, had killed himself. She was getting revenge on these characters. She let one of the Yakuza members fall in love with her. Exactly. He's like, I knew she was just him. there for revenge the whole time. Yeah. I thought I was smarter than this yeah. teenage girl, which a lot of people in this movie end up presuming uh, doesn't go well for any of them. No. But that's that's why Kaneko ends up being involved. But I remember watching this movie and, again, going into it very blind. And I remember a lot of it being very tense for me. In this moment, uh, shortly after this moment, when uh, he con- he he confronts uh, Kaneko's old psychiatrist who was seen in one of the photos, I do remember pausing the movie and taking like a 20-minute break because it was becoming so emotionally overwhelming for me. I mean, the frenetic editing and intense storytelling uh, probably did not help, but by this point, it had layered on so much tragedy and yeah. trauma i remember having to like literally pause it and go outside for like 10 or 20 minutes and just kind of i still smoked at the time so I'm the sure psychiatrist the psychiatrist is like oh yeah she couldn't sleep she was like paranoid i prescribed her all these drugs and it's just sort of one of those movies where you're watching it and you're like gosh i hope this isn't as bad as it's kind of setting this all up to be because this mm-hmm. is a a nasty mix uh and it yeah i'd say it actually just ends up getting worse <laughs> than you than you can imagine yeah yeah so eventually uh our our father on the hunt he figures out what's going on yeah he gets some and... he gets some of those pictures right and there's a, a good yeah. scene where he looks at them in the car and it's just one of those things where you know they don't show you the pictures at this moment but his reaction tells you basically all you need to know and you're just like this is pretty bad so the you know, and then, surprisingly, he handles the rest of the movie very well. Totally he normally. it to the proper authorities, and yeah. then everything's fine. Well, it's at this point that basically everything's on the table for the most part. You're mm-hmm. like, Kaneko is definitely a like active participant in this sort of crime ring. Uh, she is like, gone off the deep end, and... and if she has disappeared as she has, it probably, you know, has something 
to like she probably is holding some of the responsibility there yeah <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh yeah this i think like the the ultra violence from here on out is um is quite quite wild one thing i want to ask you about because what do you think this movie is reaching at trying to say i have a few different ideas but like i'm not fully sure i know yeah well it's um I really hate that I have to say this, but it's definitely I was getting a kind of Lynchian thing from it, which is about, you know, mm. um, and not in the like traditional way that word is used, but sort of in stuff like Twin Peaks and Blue Velvet, uh, what he's doing is just sort of showing the way that like corruption and, and like moral reprehensibility can sneak into these traditionally like conservative societies or idyllic mm. scenarios like you know just these kind of nightmares that are sleeping underneath the sort of like suburban dream so there's i think there's an element of that at play in this mm. movie just by the way it sort of shows you these sequences of the kids in school and is definitely playing on your presumed innocence of teenagers and school kids and is just like yeah <laughs> sort of reveals that uh, to be this, like, you know, hellish pit of corruption and just, like, uh, amoral nonsense run amok. Um, and, and then there's definitely a part of it, too, that's examining the responsibilities of the father and kind of how their crumbling relationship really just... It's not like... It doesn't draw the one-to-one -one connection that's like, well, if he drank a little less and didn't try to beat up his daughter she would not have uh joined a human trafficking ring but like at the end I, of the day it's just kind of sad <laughs> what what happens i think like i think that's i i agree with all of that the one of the 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 takes i was getting from it was like kind of this tired take of like can you really know anyone mm. even your own family members and there is a scene when Yakusho's character is torturing Kaneko's uh, psychiatrist, stabs him through the hand with a knife at some point, that he, he basically says, she is your daughter, your daughter is you. Yep. And I thought that it, it was playing with some some kind of conflicting ideas of, like, you know, generational trauma and also, like, the way you can't always know people and you can't recognize the way if you're child is acting so horrifically that it's actually because they're just mimicking patterns of behavior that you taught them mm. um obviously this is a very extreme exaggerated example but you know we do see cycles of abuse or cycles of violence in the real world that this seemed to be hinting at at such a almost uh comical level when you consider yeah. all I mean, the elements at play i i think neglect certainly plays into that like parental neglect mm. um yeah. he's so obsessed with his own sort of failures and compulsions that he can't even for a minute like pay enough attention to imagine the fact that his daughter like could have been corrupted in this way his sort of assumption yeah. from the jump and and the movie very smartly kind of sets you up in the same way where it's like she's missing there's some conspiracy at play that has like nothing to do with her direct involvement it, this was all done to her and like you know <laughs> by no fault of her own is kind of the mm -hmm. the premise you're handed up top and you know the and, movie sort of expects you to run with that and then and gets into it and is like nah that's not what we're doing here and Kaneko does address the neglect in one of the flashbacks. She says to I, you know, like, he comes over to her house and he's like, where are your parents? And she's like, oh, well, my dad's a drunk and my mom's having an affair, so I have the house to myself. Yeah. Like, it, it is gently nudged at that, like, they are absent from her life when she was there and, you know, they were all living as a family. Because by the, by the present day, he is, like, long gone not living with them or anything. And totally. Implied, it's often, like either said to him or he'll say i don't even remember what her face looks like yeah so it's implied he has not seen her in like three years it's definitely been years and that's like part of the setup of it where again a a a less twisted movie would be like oh can this guy tie it all up can he get his shit together can he solve the mystery can he reunite with his daughter and this movie's like no he cannot uh, kevin james in world of conico <laughs> 
I would not. Uh, I'd not be lining up to see that one. You wouldn't catch. I would. That'd be an interesting. That'd be interesting. <laughs> Um, we should talk about Kaneko and the actress who plays her because it's a very skilled performance. Uh, this is Nana Komatsu in her first feature film role ever. Uh, and mm-hmm. she's pretty young when they're shooting this very morally corrupt movie. And I think she handles all of the material super well when the movie's asking her to be sort of idealistic and innocent. She definitely sells that. And then I think you always run the risk of a precocious child who has to do this sort of like sinister knowing performance um she just sells yeah this this sense of it's funny to go back to like the poster image that i'm looking at right now even that even what that image is selling you on the movie is like not not even you don't get that image in the movie i think because her sort of like she's too there's a smirk on that image that's not present tonally in the film at all like it never smirks or has its way it's very like she's very stone-faced and just dour and like resolved to the Mm -hmm. evil acts that she's committing and and part of that is much more frightening than if yeah this was a sort of over-the-top like true villainess performance it really is just something that you're watching uh maybe with your fingers over your eyes being like jesus christ this is pretty like this is bad by the time we meet and follow conico like she is cemented in her revenge and as a character she's very like cold and distant from everyone else and i think by the end you realize it's kind of like a tunnel vision like she is just doing what she needs to ultimately get revenge for her boyfriend who was forced to kill himself because of the sex trafficking ring um and also i don't know maybe you just have to close part of your heart when you are doing what she is ultimately doing which I think the implication is there that she recognizes this is bad. This is not a good thing to do to people. It's like she does not seem to have any glee in partaking in it like the other characters do. But she has just accepted that this is what she is going to do for her ultimate goal. Yeah, there's a real just like lack of emotion or motivation outside of this path that she has set herself on. And it obviously uh, ends up in a not great place you know i think it was uh maybe confucius uh said something like uh, when you when you set out for revenge dig two graves now i'm not sure you've ever heard that quote before or sort of had that referenced so if you need me to kind of unpack that just let me know but you know that's yeah, a, that's a bit, that's something a, to think yeah i'm a bit confused sis myself from that one yes confucius, com- um, so anyway, no, I, I, I got it. I picked it up. I, I've, I've seen a few movies directed by Park Chan. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. I know, I know for a fact that you've played Red Dead Redemption too, so you might be familiar with that thematically. <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so, so, so we learn that all these disparate bodies across uh, this city, which I believe is Saitama, uh, searching for Kaneko. We, we finally figure out why. Um, she's got some she photos. Leaked. She leaked a bunch of photos of some old men fucking some not old people. You might uneloquently say. I was gonna. So I was gonna less leak. eloquently say diddling kids. So the yakuza, the police who are in bed with the yakuza, because one of the cops is one of the old men. They're all working together to track this woman down. And uh, it just so happens that their father gets in the mix. By this point. He no longer is worried about her own safety. He just wants to kill her himself, as he says, over and over and over. Yeah, he's like, I fucked um, up. Uh, this one's on me. Let me clean it up. Yeah, he, at one point, there's a moment where he's getting the absolute shit kicked out of him. And he says, I, I just want to put my hands around my daughter's neck and kill her. Yeah. It's so funny. It's not maybe, uh, not maybe the most morally just quest that we're following at this point. Yeah, uh, so the Yakuza tries to... The Yakuza tries to get Yakuza's character on their side to kill this cop who is in bed with the Yakuza, who's kind of just um, gone off the chain, uh, gone off his leash. Um, he's, he's essentially a hitman. Yeah, this is Yakuza, this is where it's playing both sides starts getting a little convoluted because the timelines have sort of like fully crossed over now, mm-hmm. and you're getting characters whose motivations at one point were like a ruse that have shifted. But basically, yeah, our Jokerified cop 
is sort of our main lead at this point into solving the mystery. Because that's that's what the back half of this movie basically is. You're introduced to all of these players, all with their own motivations. Most of it is, I want to find and kill Kaneko. But that's kind of, that's where we're all racing towards at the end of this movie. Is like, okay, hold up. Where actually is she? Is she even alive at this point? Uh, who was the last person to see her? Like, where did she go? What was her involvement? All of these we, are the questions that are hanging over the back half of this film. We get an absolutely horrific scene where uh, uh, they break into an apartment and uh, violate a dirty cop's wife. Yeah, so so that's in his in front of his son. He go he goes back to uh, to his his well of you know interrogation or uh, mo- manipulation tactics, which is just yeah, dip right into the old. Uh, the old sexual assault bag. And then he ties them up and takes them to meet their father. This is a character who's like loosely in the film, also just kind of thrown in and not really necessary, but it does lead us to the best fight scene in the oh, movie crazy. on top of a parking structure, I believe at an airport um, where two men just shoot each other numerous times. It's so sick. He it rules. He uh, he kills his own wife at one point. Yeah, it's inscrutable. This must be an unlistenable episode as we try to unpack everything that happens in these two well, hours. Here's a very cool thing that happens. These two guys are fighting. These two very shitty cops. Uh, they're they got knives. They got guns. They're stabbing each other. They're shooting each other. They're punching at each other. Um, at one point towards the end of the fight. Uh, Yakushu points a gun at the guy and his his master strategy is grab the gun palm on the barrel to push it away from his forehead and then he just gets like three of his fingers blasted off that was definitely one of the most visually striking moments in the movie I'm like I'm not sure how good of a strategy that is but it rocks uh, for me to watch it something we should point out is our main character has not changed clothes once during this movie oh yeah he's got a a great sick linen suit on the whole time he looks great it's it's a great visual gag where at the beginning it's just a little messy and by the end it is covered in so much sweat, blood and probably other like every uh, fluid you liquids can imagine and yeah. fluid that he looks fucking insane. It rules. I mean and he it's very fitting that he does so because this this film is just one big descent into madness and it's definitely uh conveyed on on the face and clothes of our main character. Yeah, and then uh, it all just doesn't really work out for anyone. The Yakuza dudes are all dead. The cop has been hit by a car, and we just get a kind of an unceremonious jump in time about four months. Yeah. Where Yakusho honestly seems a little more mentally stable, but he is retracked down Kaneko's teacher. He's like, that's the one lead that I had that I never really wrapped up, right? He was like, there's something yeah. going on there that I could not quite figure out. And he has finally identified in those pictures he has held on to, which uh, I would do that. certainly get him life in prison for just holding on to those. Um, he's identified one of the little girls in it as Kaneko's teacher's daughter. Uh-huh. And we get one flashback in time to uh, Kaneko's teacher, who is... Very briefly in the movie is someone who is interrogated, but we don't really learn much from her. And we see at some point, right before the events of the present day in the film, it's like four days before, because there's a timer yeah, in the movie. Yeah, it, it, I think it gives starts, you the days. It's like 12, yeah, 12 23, like, 2013, mm-hmm. right? And then it goes yeah. a couple of days back. So you're like, this is kind of whatever the inciting incident of this entire mystery was. We're finally yeah. about to get the answer for that, um, and and we do. And the teacher goes up to Kaneko at school one day, and it's like, hey, you know, I, I know you've been kind of friendly with my daughter, who the movie implies is quite a few years younger than Kaneko. Significantly. Uh, yeah. And she says, you know, she had a cell phone that she said you, you got her, and Kaneko was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I didn't tell you, but like, yeah, I got her a cell phone, and they uh, they make a, a quick little trip to with each other where Kaneko reveals, you know, yes, your daughter is doing that. She is part of this, mm-hmm. and, and and it's really implied she is willfully doing it. 
you know yeah teacher. Well, it's like she doesn't understand what she signed up to like it's it's implied she is very young yeah and like 10 willfully kind of part of this uh-huh and Kaneko is um unsympathetic laughs at well teacher. is also like you know the the sort of unspoken thing in this conversation is like you you did this you kind of introduced mm-hmm. her to this world right the teacher to her credit kind of knows and it's not one of those things that's like Kaneko help me out she's like uh what's going on here um yeah and then I think like it, yeah pictures come into play at some point the teacher does what everyone should have done in this movie three years ago so, and uh stabs and kills Kaneko basically immediately well in the gut with the screwdriver like, right yeah, yeah yeah just uh that that's it the, the just she's not wasting time she Kaneko kills her, buries her well Kaneko has it. an incredible reaction she stabs her once in the gut first with the screwdriver and I think Kaneko kind of looks down and just goes like oh why'd you do that like, <laughs> yeah. and then yeah she goes to town um and then yeah we learn basically she drove her out to the middle of nowhere buried her body and we get a very sort of compelling closing scene where um Yakushu is it's an interrogation that sort of mirrors that conversation with Kaneko where they're like very sort of plainly speaking in a car. And he's like, this mm-hmm. is your daughter in the photos. Right. And the teacher's like, yup. Right. And he's like, so what'd you do with my daughter? And she's just like, you know, basically probably what you, what you should have done. <laughs> what someone in this movie fucking needed to do. Uh, and, took and her off the board. Like, and then he's like, well, I wanted to kill her. So you, he takes her to the middle of nowhere in a snowstorm, and we get a 10-minute extended sequence. We learn he's now on heroin, very unfortunate, um, where he tells her to dig up her corpse so he can kill her again. Yeah. He's, <laughs> well, he's, I, I think part of it is he's like, I don't really maybe believe you or, like, I need mm. – you know, he obviously – he doesn't deserve it in any sense of the word, but he wants this sense of closure, um, this mm-hmm. mystery, this unraveling, basically um, destroyed his psyche, his well-being for a number of reasons and in a number of ways. But, like, yeah, I, I think the ending of this movie really ties everything up very strongly because, you know, on the whole journey, I'm a little – I don't want to say like unimpressed or whatever, but I'm like, this is like a bad character. Everyone in this movie is like are bad people. And I look, I can watch art about people I don't agree with because I have (laughs) two brain cells and I know that it's not a direct endorsement of them, but I'm kind of Hollywood's romanticizing cannibalism. Now, didn't you read Duckworth's tweet? No, (laughs) I did. Yes. I, I, I I do not, I don't engage with that. Um, (laughs) Except the whale, the whale is bad. Look, he, at the end of this, it's just sort of like, He's so broken. This is kind of the only thing he has left. He's like, okay, like, let's go. You're going to show me where you buried her. And it's kind of the, uh, how do I phrase this? Funny, most funny in a cruel way moment of this movie where she's just like, I don't remember. Like, it's fucking snowing out here. It's been three years. Uh, She's somewhere around here. And he kind of hands her a shovel and he's like, let's just dig. (laughs) Like, let's find her. And that's basically how the movie ends and then it smash cuts to a dean martin song um and you absolutely you immediately at least for me it immediately just crystallizes like okay yeah this movie sort of knew where it was going the whole time and was playing me like a fool and so i immediately had to run at least yeah the first sort of section back and i was like yeah all the pieces were there the whole time i think this movie is very uh incredibly sharply written and just oozes style and like tells very fucked up story in a very self-confident way and so glad you brought up the dean martin song at the end because uh granted that's uh an original song that was or that's a that's a song that was pre-written that was used in the soundtrack but the composer of this movie would you believe is yoko kano oh no shit you might have heard in cowboy bebop (laughs) I, i was gonna say it at the very beginning that the opening credits are very Cowboy Bebop, so that's yeah. not surprising at all. Um, yep. I don't know who did the sort of when we flash back to those high school scenes at first with like the animated swimmer sequences. There's some mm-hmm. very sunny, like Flaming Lips esque indie rock playing pretty quietly below all those. I was just like, this is great. The soundtrack's fantastic. Soundtrack's fantastic. Movie, what are your thoughts? Is the movie fantastic? 
Yeah, I really liked I it. Saw, I saw you gave it four stars on Letterboxd. Yeah, it's a, it's a four star on Letterboxd movie. Um, I really, yeah, I think the way that it plays with your expectations and like noir pulp mystery tropes is really great. Um, I'm excited to revisit it too, just to get a better mm-hmm. sense kind of of the motivations. I'm I'm someone who loves a nice crime mob detective movie but what i love the most about those movies is watching them ad nauseum just repeat over and over again to pick up on little motivations and those dangling plot threads and i think this is one that's definitely going to reward repeat visits or honestly like watching it knowing where it goes (laughs) so if you've made it this far and you haven't seen the movie yet probably still worth going back and getting into it Rewatching this movie only cemented how much I really, really love this fucking movie. I think it is underseen, under talked about. I think if you're just a fan of aggressive, loud cinema, like you should seek this out. It's very easy to find on streaming. Yeah, it's on Hulu, um, Shutter, and Mubi right now. I understand Apple, Amazon, everything. <laughs> I understand why it didn't blow up the box office because it, it there's there's some hard asks in there when it comes to. Well, I think it I think it did in Japan. I think it was very successful in Japan. Yeah, I'm reading um, that. I mean, it basically launched the actress who plays Kaneko. It launched her entire career. What? So, um, like, not for nothing there. What has she done since? She was in Silence by Morning Scorsese. Oh wow, she's in a live action JoJo's Bizarre Adventure movie as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's. You've peaked then. Uh, I think that was done by Takashi Miike. This one specifically? Yes, it was. Yeah. That rocks. That's so um, cool. Yeah, no, she she's kind of a bigger name since being in uh, World of Kaneko. She was also in Destruction Babies, which I want to see so bad. Hmm. And uh, it's hard to track down other than like a 380p illegal upload on Billy Billy. Look, I'm, I might just go ahead and watch. I'm always saying that 380p is my favorite quality to watch a film and I, i'm like i'm on <laughs> the right. i'm on the criterion collection forums i'm like they keep upgrading these movies to 4k when are they going to downgrade them and release them uh, <laughs> with the funny. unregistered hypercam 2 logo in the corner any um any recommendations based on this movie yes other than watch this damn movie watch this movie um i'm just gonna say again and this this is a compliment coming from me a movie i was definitely think of watching this film is under the silver lake just that sort of oh, like sure. teens up to no good unraveling conspiracy. Um, and on a yeah. similar vein, uh, Michael Haneke's The White Ribbon is it's definitely more muted and missing the sort of violence of this. But it does the same sort of trick where it plays uh, on your expectation. Like it sort of delivers you a premise that's like something's going wrong here. And then you're like, well, it couldn't be xyz and then turns out uh it's worse than you ever could have imagined sure um i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna suggest a cliche one ichi the killer has a very similar plot yeah it's true Uh, this is a very mike movie it's not surprising to me that he watched this and was like you come work with me yeah uh wait did they work together on the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure thing. <gasps> oh, I thought you meant the director. No. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, I'm going to recommend uh, Ichi the Killer. It has a very similar plot, and if you want something more depraved, then it's basically like World, World of Conico, only uh, visually much more disturbing. So there you go. Check it out. Some bad stuff going um, on. Yeah. There you go. World of Conico. Watch it. Yeah. Please. World it of Kana, so good. World of Conico run to the cinema to the streaming service of your choice and watch this film the world of conoco uh next week we are talking about another sort of crime mystery film with intersecting timelines it's called triad underworlds uh a very interesting movie uh that i think is going to give us a lot to talk about so join us next week same time same place uh, for another episode of region free thanks so much for listening Peace. Bye. There is a house in New Orleans. They call the rising sun. It's been the ruin of many a poor girl. And Lord, I know.
Is when he drinks his liquor. 